Uh, cool. So I'm so happy that um, Andre DeVuse is here joining us. Um, I don't think it's saying too much to say that he has just flown in here almost directly from Milan. So not only are we lucky to have him here, we're lucky that he's going to be conscious uh, for this evening. Barely. Yeah, barely conscious. That's how we like our writers um, <laughs> here at Hugo House. I first met Andre DeVuse III. I don't know if he would even remember this. It was... Um, the way that a lot of people um, might be meeting him for the first time, maybe tonight, maybe at another reading, um, I was a reader and an aspiring writer, and he was giving a reading at the Brattle um, Theater in Cambridge, Massachusetts, in support of his novel, The Garden of Last Days. Um, uh, you know, during the reading, I was inspired. Um, the whole audience was completely transfixed and charmed by Andre and, and his work, and the signing line for the event was enormous. It was one of those massive lines that stretched on forever, and I really wanted to get my book signed, so I was in the line, but it wasn't going anywhere, it seemed. It just took a long time. I didn't know why. It was very strange until I got a little closer and I could see what was happening. He was engaging every single person in line in conversation, genuinely interested. Um, I've never seen anybody uh, do this, any other writer. I mean, he was genuinely interested in their stories. He wanted to know who they were, what they did. And in fact, when I got up on, you know, to, to the signing line, he did the same with me. And um, it, it, was, it, was it was inspiring, actually. And as I got to know Andre over the years, I could see, you know, that that interest wasn't like a trick of book tour um, or something. It wasn't an act. It was genuine and tangible. And it might explain a little bit why Andre's books are so humane. Uh, filled with characters that pulse with living details that make the characters feel real, uh, that make them breathe, and I hope we're going to learn a little bit about that tonight from him. Andre de Busse III is the author of seven books, um, The Cage Keeper and Other Stories, Blues Man, and the New York Times bestsellers, House of Sand and Fog, The Garden of Last Days, Gone So Long, and his memoir, Townie, uh, which was a number four New York Times bestseller and a New York Times editor's choice. His work has been included in the Best American Essays of 1994, the Best Spiritual Writing of 1999, and his novel, The House of Sand and Fog, was a finalist for the National Book Award, a number one New York Times bestseller, and made into a little movie um, that was Academy, uh, nominated for an Academy Award, starring Ben Kingsley and Jennifer Connelly. His book, Dirty Love, was published in the fall of 2013 and was listed as a New York Times notable book, a uh, New York Times editor's choice, a notable fiction choice from the Washington Post, and a Kirkus starred best book of 2013. And he, if you've listened to the audiobooks, he narrates his own audiobooks, and he's won an audio, audiophile best voices of the year award um, for his memoir, Townie, um, and a 2013 earphones award for Dirty Love. I love these details, it's really wonderful. Um, Andre was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship, the National Magazine Award for Fiction, two Pushcart Prizes, and he's a 2012 recipient of an American Academy of Arts and Letters Award in Literature. His books are published in over 25 languages. We're so lucky to have him here. He teaches at the University of Massachusetts Lowell and lives in Massachusetts with his wife, Fontaine, a modern dancer, and their three children. Please join me in welcoming Andre de Buse III. <laughs> Thank you. Oh my goodness, Rod. <laughs> Thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, how are you? No, I am seriously jet lagged. If I start to slur, I'm not drunk or under the influence of anything, anything but Italy. <laughs> Molto piacere, buonasera. Um, but nonetheless, I'm going to talk for four hours and five minutes. I believe that's what you told me I was going to do. So look, the, the, the title is, what is the title? Writing Character Driven Fiction or something, right? Forgive me, I'm going to do something, I've, well, maybe it's good. I'm, I'm going to talk to you in a way that I've never spoken to anyone, because in preparation for this talk, I, I dug deeper. You know, there are some basic things we can say about character development. But what came to me as I was preparing to talk to you all, and, and Rob, thank you for having me. And by the way, his sweetheart, Jennifer Haig, is one of my favorite living writers on the planet Earth, and it's a real honor to be here with Jennifer Haig. I just want to say, too. Um, as I was digging into what I want to say, I dug myself into a ditch of failure. Failure, failure, oh, and more layers of failure. And I realized that there's no way that I can, I am going to time myself so I don't go more than 40 minutes. Um, I realized that I cannot talk about 
trying to create rich character-driven stories with emphasis there on trying to create or aspiring to create, that I can't talk about it without talking about being a human being first and a little bit of my own story leading to being a writer in the first place. Maybe like half of you, because half of us divorce in this family, you might come from a divorced family. My mom and dad, as you know, I'm the son, probably, if you don't know, you, you're in for a treat to read my old man. I am the son of a great short story writer named Andre Debuse. But what I'm going to tell you about is when he was 20 and he proposed to my 18-year-old future mother. And my 18-year-old future mother goes to her father, my third grade educated pipe fitter grandfather. And she says she's going to elope with this man from Lafayette, Louisiana. And my grandfather says, well... There ain't been no goddamn divorces in this family. And if this don't work out, you ain't coming home. And nine years and four kids later, it did not work out. My parents split up. It was the 60s. You know, I actually think if they were married a little later in life, they might have made it. I don't know. And I watched something happen to my mom that maybe you've seen in your own lives. You're friends with someone for all these years. They split up. Now you're only hanging out with Dave. You still love Mary. Where's Mary? Well, you're only hanging out with Mary. I still love Dave. Where's Dave? My father was teaching, our father was teaching at this local uh, junior, high, junior college in, in, in uh, north of Boston. He was making $7,000 a year as a, as a full professor, 7000 which is a lot more in the late 60s than it is now, but it still wasn't much for a family of six. So now they break up. And my mother discovers that all their friends were really his friends because there were no more friends in the house. Because of what uh, her father said to her, she's not going to pack up we four kids and drive down to Louisiana. And her friends have dumped her the way friends dump somebody in the couple. And she has no sister or brother to turn to, no mother or father to turn to, no cousins to turn to, no aunts or uncles to turn to, and now she has no friends. She's uneducated, unemployed. She's 27 with four kids. And this is how my older sister and I, my younger brother, my little sister began our, our adolescence. Um, I, I saw my mom do what millions of young women do, single mothers. She went and got two jobs. She worked as a nurse's aide and a waitress. She started to put herself through school. She got a degree where the big money is in social services, which I'm proud of. And my father was not a deadbeat dad. It was a 70s divorce. He gave his child support check, but it was a 70s divorce. We didn't once spend the night at his apartment. And now, by the way, his $7,000 a year has to support you know, his new apartment, his new shitbox $100 car, us. So we went from first world poor to first world poorer. Um, but we move two to three times a year for cheaper rent. Um, and, you know, it's, it's like a Hollywood cliche, but twice we moved at midnight with the lights out so the landlord wouldn't know we were running out on the rent. I can't tell you how many times as a kid I would, I would hear the rapping at the door and watch my mother rouse herself to go to the door, and, and there was the landlord looking for the rent. So I watched my mother... She, she either needed to buy groceries or put gas in the car to go to work. If she bought groceries, she couldn't fill the tank. Or she put gas in the car, but then didn't buy groceries. Or she paid the heating bill, but then couldn't pay the rent. And that's how it was all of our growing up. I think I went to maybe 14 schools before I got to high school. So I was always the new kid. And you know, kids are very sweet, one or two at a time. Put four or five together. Right? A little blood in the water. They make the Taliban look like pleasant people. And I was a small kid who wore glasses and used adverbs in daily speech. <laughs> and so we lived in this town, and maybe you know that part of the world, but we lived in the Merrimack River. Jack Kerouac was from the town of Lowell, which is a textile town on that river. We lived in this town of Haverhill, which is also an old shoe town. It had the highest per capita number of bars in the town. It was... Uh, dead for years from the Italians. The Italians started importing really good shoes and 100 years earlier in the town had been dead since. The high school had the 2,500 kids in it, had the seventh worst drug problem in the nation. We had undercover narcotic cops. I was terrified of the place. 
my sister and uh, sisters and brother and I would skip, no, my younger sister never did, but my older sister and my brother and I would skip 60 to 90 days of school a year, and we never got a notice home. It was that kind of underserved kind of place. So I'd be sitting on the stoop, and some kid, so my name's Andre DeBuse, up there, Andre Dubas, or Doofus. I'd be sitting on the stoop, this kid would pass me a joint. This is the early 70s. Vietnam is still limping to a finish. Watergate's happening. Nixon is flying off in his helicopter, to me, which is metaphorical of so many of us having fatherless homes. And, um, you know, we all had long hair down to our waists. We're drinking Southern Comfort out of our dingo boots like Janis Joplin. We're getting high at 7 in the morning and taking drugs. It was depressing. And we're having sex. And so this kid, who's now dead, handed me a joint, and he says, Dubas, you want to hit off this joint? I said, not necessarily. Boom, and he punched me in the face, thinking, why do I have to say necessarily? <laughs> and I was a, fuck, I was a peer, I was, a, it was, I was like a poster boy for peer pressure. I would get high every morning just so I wouldn't get punched or teased or... So I laugh, right? I sometimes laugh at some black comedy of this, but the truth is when I look back on my childhood, and I wrote all about this in that a memo I came out with a few years ago called Townie, um, I have two predominant emotions. I can feel them right now. Two predominant emotions that come up for me about my own childhood. One is physical fear. I got beat up a lot. Now, I wasn't facing getting shot the way far too many young people, mainly with brown skin in inner cities, are facing. I wasn't facing getting shot to death for being on the wrong corner. But I was facing beatings and occasional knife being pulled. So I was scared all the time. And the other emotion, you guys, I had was a deep self-hatred. I just hated who I was. I hated who I was because I never fought back. And if you know violence yourself, and maybe you do, you tend to have three reactions to it. You either fight like hell, you run like hell, or you freeze. And I was the kid who always froze. I always froze. And it took years for me to figure it out, and writing my memoir helped me figure it out. I froze because I was still trying to figure out, why is he punching me in the face? I wasn't mean to him. Why is he being mean to me? Years later, the Tiananmen Square massacre happened. It, it's, it's a tragedy that as a world community, we never talk about this. I still think it's a real crime against humanity. We actually went to Beijing and, and, and took part in the Olympics. We forget that some very brave young Chinese students protested for democratic reforms. The dictator put up with it for a few weeks and then mowed them down. Who shot them? Kids their age from the provinces, farmers' kids. Um, I've taught Chinese students, and they say this never happened because it's been excised from Chinese history. Well, it did happen. And there was a British uh, war correspondent in Tiananmen Square in Beijing who witnessed the massacre, and he describes this one moment where this young uh, leader, a charismatic young man, 23 years old, was shot to death by the approaching troops. His girlfriend, who was also one of the leaders, Screamed at the soldier who did it, why, 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 and he shot her to death. And I'm reading this in the Boston Globe, and I'm weeping. But it made me think about innocence. And it occurred to me that maybe that's, maybe that's innocence, where you're still asking why to brutality. Maybe we lose our innocence when we don't ask anymore. We just expect it, and then we do something about it. And it's not a good day when you lose that kind of innocence. I lost that kind of innocence on a day, uh, so my, you know, we didn't go to school. And then on days I did go to school, I'd come home. My older sister at 16 started to sell drugs, because that's how kids got money in the neighborhood. And the truth is, I was thrilled she sold drugs, because she had money and she would buy subs for us, we didn't have groceries in the house. But I'd come home and there'd be a couple of Harleys in front of our rented house my mother couldn't afford. She was gone 14 hours a day working down in Boston. And I'd go in, it'd be grown men I didn't know, rolling joints and divvying up their drugs to sell on my kitchen table. There'd be somebody playing the stereo. I'd go to my bedroom, there'd be somebody screwing in my bed. My brother and I, my younger brother Jeb, built this tree house in the backyard to give us, to give us a sanctuary. Now this is a rented house. 
and we, we, took, we got the lumber from the playroom of the rented house. We, every other stud we ripped out and used as our frame. To insulate it, we went around the neighborhood and stole every welcome mat off every porch and nailed it on the walls. I stole a, a friggin' uh, cord out of a dumpster and ran it from my, my poor mother's house to our, so we had radio and like a heater in the winter. And she said, well, why is our electric bill so high? I don't know, ma. <laughs> but it was our sanctuary, and if you leave little kids alone, if they can, if they, if they can run around with no adult supervision, without a larger family around, they're going to do what we did, which is they're going to get drunk, they're going to get high, they're going to have sex, they're going to steal things. And my brother was 12 or 13 years old, and he was probably having sex with a 12 or 13-year-old girl up in the treehouse. Somehow it got to her brother, who was a 21-year-old military policeman in the Army, and he comes home on leave expressly to beat up my little brother, Jeb. My little brother, Jeb, was and is a genius. At that time, 12, 13, he was listening to Andreas Segovia albums in his bedroom, and he was teaching himself how to play Bach preludes on the guitar by listening to, al to the album. He's figuring out the chords. Uh, incredible. So the word's out for days that this guy's back from Thailand or wherever he was stationed, and he's back to beat up my little brother, who weighed about 125 pounds. I weighed about 135 pounds. One spring day, he's come around the corner with his posse of hangers on. My brother is just getting dropped off by a special ed teacher because he had dyslexia. I said, run inside, go, and he didn't. And this man comes and beats my brother. Uh, I, I thought. I thought he was beating him to death. And um, he's on the, you know, and, I'm, and I said, Johnny, please, Johnny. He said, shut up, Dubas, you're next. And I did what I always did. I froze. And I just prayed, just, you know, just don't kill him. Let's, let's have it be over. And it was a weird day, you guys, because my mother was not at work. She had, she had the flu. And she comes running out of the house in her night clothes, her gown, she picks a stick up off the ground. She starts swinging it at this grown man, beaten up. By the way, he had a shaved head and a little mustache. And if you remember the 70s, nobody had short hair or shaved heads except for cops and soldiers. And, um, and he called her the worst thing you can call a woman. And um, I did nothing, her older son. I just was still praying for it to hurry up and be over. He eventually stopped. They disappear, laughing down the street. My mother and the teacher helped my bleeding brother. He, I thought for sure he was going to go to intensive care. He was messed up for a few weeks, but there were no broken bones. He was all messed up, though. They brought him in the house, and I stood outside of my house for, it could have been five minutes or an hour, but my self-hatred had reached its, its pit. It felt like poison to be in this coward's body. I couldn't bear to be me anymore. I eventually went into the rented house our mother could not afford. I walked into the bathroom. They were tending to him in the kitchen. And I looked at my 14-year-old face. And I said, I don't care what happens to you anymore. I don't care if someone shoots you, stabs you, beats you to death. You're never going to not fight back ever again, ever. And that night, I started to do push-ups. I got like five. I started to do sit-ups. I got three. But I started to work out. I stopped taking drugs. I stopped drinking. I joined a boxing gym. And much to my surprise, not only had athletic ability, I had boxing talent. And about a year and a half later, and honestly, the whole time, I'm training for my first fight, not a boxing match, a street fight, against someone who needed what I wanted to give them, someone who was a bully, someone who held everything I hated, which was cruelty. And nothing, nothing got me more upset than anyone still does. I get murderously angry. I, I won't murder anyone, but I get so angry at the powerful lording over the powerless in whatever form it is. We're at this bar, it's a wild west, we don't need IDs to get in. My brother, who is an eccentric genius to this day, a cat got run over in front of our house, he chopped the tail off the cat and wore it as a tie for three weeks till it started to smell, smell a little funky. He had a, a denim vest he'd embroidered with flowers. 
and uh, wild hair and whiskers that I couldn't even grow then. And on his feet were slippers he'd sewn himself. It's three degrees in Massachusetts. It's a February night. A band's playing. It's full of people. This local thug, and I mean he was a predator, walks in with his, with his boys. And at the high school I'd known him, he was, uh, he was tall and handsome and well-built, and he was cruel. He was the guy who made fun of the fat girls. He was the guy who slapped around the effeminate gay kid. I once saw him take a kid who had uh, cerebral palsy that confined him to a wheelchair, and he pushed him down the hallway so fast the kid in the wheelchair was crying with terror, and this guy was laughing. Now he walks in. He sees, immediately looks at my brother and his get-up, looks at his slippers and says something to my brother. My brother said, let's go outside. And I'm standing there with my milk. And by the way, if you order milk at a bar, it's watered-down milk. And I said, my brother's always been so brave. They walk out, and we're facing off with his friends. Now, I've never been in a fight, but I'm training for it, mainly psychologically. The thug comes out. Seconds later, he'd push my brother down two flights of stairs. I run down. Are you all right? Yeah, but I lost a slipper. I run upstairs, and I say to this guy, whose real name was Chucky, there's a bouncer here, I said, hey, Chucky, my brother lost his slipper. You know where it is? And I said it because I knew he would say something. Your brother slipper? He's a fucking faggot. Boom! And I knocked his two front teeth down his throat, and I kept swinging, and the bouncer got between us. And that felt so good that I did it for like 10 years. I'd go to a bar, I'd wait for some guy to backhand his wife or his girlfriend, and I'd put him in the hospital, or I'd try to. I'd go to a house party. There was a gang in our, our town called, the, well, I won't tell you the real names. But they're all dead now except for one. They would go to, five brothers, they would go to a house party, they would walk in, wouldn't know anyone, they grabbed the, the butt or breast of any woman they felt like, if anybody said anything, four of them would beat up one. They were, they were bad guys. Um, I would go looking for them. And, and I was insane. I was, an ins I was an insane young man. And you could almost put a, a, a mask and a cape on me. It was almost comical. I, was a vic I became a victimizer of victimizers. The local police love me because I'm wailing on guys that they want to but can't without losing their badges. Women started to notice me. And then the most beautiful thing that could have happened happened to me, which is people started to call me tough. Hey, well, look out for Dubas. He's a tough kid. I and mean, that, to me, was getting a bath from God. A tough kid. Nothing was better. But you know, we all have that little voice. We all get it, right? We all get it. If you look at the word intuition, you know what the Latin root of that word is? You know what it actually means? It means to watch over or to guard. I, I, I was so thrilled to have changed my life in this way. But I knew I was going to get killed doing it, and maybe worse, I was going to kill someone else. Because I didn't like violence. I hated violence. But I was a violent young man. So I started a box as a way to stop being violent. It's OK. I know I'm not afraid to fight anymore. I'm afraid not to fight. So I, just, I need to stay away from places where it's easy to find a fight. And I'll just be a pugilist, because I seem to be good at it. That'll be my sport. And, and I'll go to college and, OK. So now I'm out of college. I'm living in a town, if you know Massachusetts, it's called Lynn, Mass. It's a really tough town. It's tougher now than it was then. And the, they have a motto, Lynn, Lynn, the city of sin. You don't come out the way you went in. I'm working construction with my brother. I'm in my early 20s. And I have a hard time believing in a God. I don't know about you, but I do believe in the divine. I do believe something quite beautiful exists in and around us at all times. Maybe it's just love. I don't know. I've always, well, I haven't always felt it. That night, something that I can only call the divine Oh, I work construction all day. It's winter. I'm in my sweats. I'm prepared. I'm training for the Golden Gloves competition down in Lowell, Mass, the town Kerouac's from. I'm very serious about it, and I'm doing pretty well in the, in the uh, training. So I'm dressed to go run down and do that. Instead of doing that, though, something that I can only call the divine 
said, you know, why don't you sit down, grab a piece of paper and a pencil. And I brewed a cup of tea. And I began to write from the point of view of a young woman losing in her virginity in the woods in Maine with her boyfriend in his Pontiac. And when I finished writing, I took a sip of my tea, and it was room temperature when it had been boiling. I thought I'd been writing for 10 minutes. It had been clearly over an hour. And I'd done all these drugs from 13 to 16. But I'd never felt so aware and awake and alive as I did right that moment. I was in this higher state of awareness I'd never felt before. I'd never noticed how out of level the radiator was or how rusty it was. I'd never noticed the loose linoleum tiles underneath it. I never noticed the dirty masking tape on the refrigerator handle. And I'd never felt so much like myself in my life. So here I am. Here I am. I'm not saying I want to be a writer, but I knew that if I wanted to continue to be truly myself, I had to keep writing words on a page. I had been writing five, six days a week since that night. Um, and then the real challenges began. I began to read and realized I hadn't read anything. Um, when I first began to write, and I worked, like all of us, I worked really hard on it. And I, I spent you know, hours every morning before whatever job uh, I had to do, I spent on it. And the first thing I noticed about my writing was when I would compare it to the writing in books that I admired, it just seemed false. There was something fake about it. And it took me a few years to figure it out. Then I read the work of Brees D.J. Pancake. Has anyone read him? Brees D.J. Pancake from West Virginia coal mine country. Jennifer, I know you know him. You guys, check out Brees D.J. Pancake. Uh, you won't forget that name. He shot himself at age 26. He left behind uh, stories that his mother sent around, just like the John Kennedy O'Toole story. Um, it had an incredibly beautiful debut when it came out after his death. I read it, and what I learned was, well, first of all, what I saw was he was writing so beautifully from everything he knew, and maybe everybody he loved. Years later, I read an incredibly helpful line from Willa Cather. A writer is at her best only when writing within the character and range of her deepest sympathies. Isn't that great? only when writing within the character and range of her deepest sympathies. Now, this is next to useless as writing advice before the fact, right? Okay, I get it. I have to write what I care about. Well, I hate global warming. <laughs> I think homelessness is terrible. It's kind of the, a backwards way to approach it. But I've had this happen to me, and maybe you've had it happen to you as a writer, where you'll finish something that on one level is written pretty well or okay, and yet you somehow wrote it outside your vision of the world. You somehow wrote about it, but you don't care that much about it. And I realized, reading Brees D.J. Pancake, this is why writers should always read, among many other reasons, is he was writing from his emotional wheelhouse. He was writing about country he knew, he was writing about people he knew, and I was not. Somehow, very quickly, I wanted to sound like a writer. Maybe this had something to do with my father being a great writer with the same name, and I thought I had a lot of catching up to do, but I don't know if that was it, because honestly, you guys, I didn't, never thought about him when I was writing. I never thought about any writer when I was writing. By the way, I'm really grateful that in college I studied sociology and political science because my hatred of injustice morphed into hatred of colonialism, imperialism, misogyny, and racism. And I hadn't read any great writers, so I wasn't intimidated by the greats when I sat down. So that was helpful. I wasn't writing from my center, so I began to write about people I knew better. Bartenders and inmates and waitresses and addicted kids and alcoholic mothers and people I grew up with. But then, you know, it still wasn't that good. This is years of writing. Something was still off about it. And one of my friends who's a really brutal reader said, you know, what's this antagonist protagonist shit? Huh? What do you mean? Well, like, you got, like, good guys and bad guys. No, I don't. Yeah, you do. This guy, so-and-so, he's just like a badass. Is that all there is to him? 
And that was so helpful to hear. Because what I realized, ultimately, is that I was judging these people, these characters, these figures from my dream world, the way I used to judge flesh and blood people. Oh, he just slapped his wife? Somebody should shoot him in the head. I'm not going to shoot him, but I'm going to beat him up. The truth is, I didn't realize that I've been looking at people in fundamental black and white ways. There's a great line from a letter Hemingway wrote to his editor, Maxwell Perkins. He said, Max, the job of the writer is not to judge, but to seek to understand. Now, I don't, I don't think Hemingway would say for a second that writers can't be judgmental people. He could be a bully and an SOB. But I think what he was arguing there is that when you sit down, if your goal is to write this sort of character-driven fiction that he certainly wrote, you would better not be judging these characters or they're not going to show up. And, and I found that to be, you know, it's, it's, it's true in life. I don't know, how many of you have had, you know, the experience, if you walk up to someone, you feel them give you the once over, and they clearly have written you off and judged you. Did that feel good? No, it feels like shit. I walk away, or I do something worse. If I, if I can say, oh, you just think I'm a redneck. Well, I'll be ten times a redneck you think I am right now. It's not good. One of my favorite lines uh, or quotes about writing from anyone is from William Faulkner. He, late in his life, he was asked, what's the main thing a writer needs? He says, well, it ain't talent. He said, I know, I used to think it was talent, but I don't think it's so anymore. And I agree with the great man. I, he narrowed it down to one quality of mind. It's a pretty famous answer. A bunch of writers in the room, I'm, I'm sure you know what it is. What did he say it was? Curiosity. And his exact phrase was curiosity, insight, to wonder, to mull, and to muse why it is that man does what he does. And if you have that, talent makes no difference whether you've got it or not. What am I trying to share with you? I was too wounded as a human being to be authentically curious about anyone. I found that to be true with my girlfriends. I found that to be true with my siblings. I was too damaged to be really authentically curious. So everything I'm sharing with you right now is very simple, but it's not easy. It took a while to make the adjustment. And there's a third difficulty and failure that I experienced in my early writing years. Everything I'm describing is like the first 10 years of writing. Once I got better at not judging these characters. Once I really found myself asking, what's it like to be you, man? What's it like to be you? And by the way, a lot of the characters in my early writing came from the neighborhoods I grew up in, so some of them had done bad things. But I began to hate what they did, but not them, which took a lot of work, right? So then I'm working, and I'm working, and I notice there's another difficulty in my writing. There's another reason. There's something else that's happening. Okay, so now the characters aren't as black and white. By the way, one of my favorite lines about this is from the great Tom Waits, the American treasure. From his, his, I quoted this in Ohio. I thought I was going to get lynched by some lovely Christian people, but it may sound like blasphemy to your ears, but it's an incredible line from his song, Heart Attack and Vine. He said, there is no devil. There's just God when he's drunk. <laughs> if I ever get a tattoo, it's just going to be that line. And I realized that well, that's kind of what I believe. The truth is we all screw up, some worse than others. So with a lot of hard practice, I found that I was allowing myself, it sounds like bumper sticker Christianity here, but I was allowing myself to hate the sin and not the sinner, which led me to being more authentically curious about someone's situation in a particular moment in his or her life, which then therefore led to non-judgment, because if you are authentically curious, you are not judging any longer. But something was still off about my stories, you guys. Something was still not happening. Something was wooden. Something was stiff. Something was stale. Something was stilted. You know, Rob read these lovely accolades. I'm thinking, Jesus Christ, who the hell is that guy? And this is true for probably... Most, if not all writers, certainly everyone in the arts I know, 
Whatever I put in the world, and whatever has been noticed in a positive way, for which I'm grateful, of course, have been the phoenixes that rose from the ashes of what failed. And that ash heap is tall and wide and deep. And I'm grateful for it, right? So I'm still writing and failing, writing and failing, writing and failing. I don't mean no one's publishing it. It's not good. Okay, now the characters are coming more alive because of what I just explained. And, and you know, but there's something going on. None of my stories had any dramatic tension in them at all. It was like a watercolor you stare at and then walk out of the room. And, and one day after, I sp okay, I spent two and a half years. So my, my third book, House of Sand and Fog, made me an 18-year overnight success. It was my second novel, my third book, probably the seventh book I'd written, though. One of the books you'll never see is a novel called <laughs> Lie Down and Make Angels. <laughs> I can't believe I just shared that with you. And let me tell you, man, I was writing all about growing up in a, f I'm not going to swear, shitty mill town with a single mother, with drugs, and kids having sex at 11 and 12 and 13. I mean, I lost my virginity at 13, and I was late in the neighborhood. No fathers around, tripping our brains out when we should have been doing our homework. Vietnam limping to a finish. And every time the father, I based on my father, walked into a scene, I made him look far worse than my father ever was. Every time the mother came in, I made her look like a disaster. Every time young Sean Dolan walked in, <laughs> oh, did I want you to love that boy. Love him, the poor bastard. Look at the shitty childhood he's got. I admire Spike Lee as a man, and I'm with him politically, but a lot of his films, I just, I, I, I'm not wild about because I feel that he is injecting his, his philosophy into his characters' mouths, and that's his right. I would like to see him make documentaries instead of feature films, but that's just my opinion. I love his passion. I think he's gifted, immensely gifted, and who am I? But I'm bringing this up because when I read Lie Down and Make Angels Over, after two and a half years on it, it was all, that's just what I was doing too. I was putting lines in the mouths of characters to make my goddamn points, to make my thematic points, to make points that I needed to make, goddamn it, because I have things to say. And the book was awful. Again. And then I noticed why, in addition to all that. So I became a rescuer. And forgive me, I had to share my personal story to make this really important point, I think, craft-wise. I'm still a rescuer. If there's a fight, I run to it. If there's a car accident, I run to it. I, I, I'm going to take actually a first responders course in the fall because like, I've been to like eight car accidents where I'm, I'm somehow the first one on the scene and I'm just a lifeguard from the 70s. <laughs> I hardly know a goddamn thing to do. I finally figured out why my stories had no dramatic tension. I was rescuing my characters from their trouble. Just as soon as the shit was starting to hit the fan, oh, I'd make it a little better for everybody. How come I hadn't seen that before? And this is, if, I'm, if, if you remember nothing that I'm trying to share with you that may be helpful, it's this. I couldn't let go of control. I couldn't let go of control. It's not because I, didn't, I was afraid I was going to fail artistically. I'm still afraid somebody's going to come and rape my sister, as they did. I'm still afraid my brother's going to kill himself, as he tried to do ten times. I'm still afraid my mother's going to drive away and never come back. I'm still afraid, still afraid, still afraid. I live in a $2 million house, thanks to Oprah, in the woods, <laughs> in a town where the most dangerous thing that can happen is you might trip over a Starbucks cup some lawyer left near his BMW, <laughs> and I've got a Louisville slugger beside my bed waiting for the bad guys to come. So now about the 10th year of my writing life, I put all this together. I get authentically curious, which means I'm not judging these people. I let go of the wheel, and if shit hits the fan, 
and she leaves him, or she, he cheats on her, or he drives drunk, or the kid gets hooked on opioids, so be it. I'm not their God, I'm their recorder, I'm their chronicler. Leo Tolstoy has this great line about art. Art is transferring feeling from one heart to another. Isn't that beautiful? And I'm convinced the only thing that's ever going to transfer any feeling is truth. And that's all I'm trying to say. You want to write honest, character-driven stories? Let go of the wheel and write the truth. I've got this kind of insomnia. I'm going to wrap it up in two minutes. I've got this insomnia. Do you guys have this where you go to bed at like 11, 12 o'clock, 2 o'clock, you're awake, you're awake for like two hours? Delayed insomnia. And I understand there are cannabis stores in this town. I'm going to look for the gummy bears, which I have discovered. But, you know, so I, I tried yoga. I tried warm milk. I tried healthy ways to get to sleep. No, I don't do that anymore. You know what I do? A couple of beers, an hour of TV, I go to bed. No more than two. Two beers, TV, go to bed. And sometimes I watch something nourishing like PBS. And I watched an interview with the great film director, Mike Nichols. You know, his first film was... Uh, the Graduate, he did all, maybe 40, 50 films, also a theater man. Died a few years ago in his 80s. And the interviewer asked him what I thought was a stupid question. And I generally don't believe that stupid questions exist, but I thought this was stupid. Mr. Nichols, what is the question the storyteller asks, sir, before creating story? So, oh, Jesus Christ, shut up. <laughs> oh, am I glad he asked because of what Nichols said. He said, well, it's not what the newspaper reporter asks. So if you're a journalist or reporter, what's the central question with which you have to grapple? Real basic, what is it? What happened? You know, the other W's, when, where, you know, 3.10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, blah, blah. But Nichols said, that's not what the storyteller has to ask. What is it that we ask? If it's not what happened, what do we ask? How and why? Yes, but that's not what he said. I'm just going to tell you, it's very elegant. You put the two together. He said, it's not what happened. But what's it like? What's it really like to be in this thing that's happened? And the key word there for me is really, meaning truly. And the only way you're going to be able to artistically grapple with that question is to let go of your agenda, your big authorial agenda, let go of what you want to say. I mean, I tell this to my students. Even if you're writing a personal essay, don't try to say a goddamn thing. It's always gone better for me when I have not tried to say anything, but instead I've tried to find something. When I haven't been gripped with a story to tell, but I've been gripped with a story to find. The word compassion is my favorite word in the English language. And again, from the Latin. Do you know what it means when you break it down etymologically? Calm means with. Passion. Talk about the passion of Christ when I was a kid. I thought, oh, I didn't know he was supposed to do that. But passion means to suffer, right? To suffer with. I think it's our job as writers. You don't have to be always writing dark, tragic stuff. But you've got to be in a place of emptiness and non judgment and authentic curiosity. And what I found again and again and again after the first 10 or 12 years of constant creative failure, I mean constant, is if I just do that, they show up. In the same way your kids will show up if you don't make them do something that they don't want to do, like go to law school. <laughs> Maybe she just wants to be a fucking poet, <laughs> right? I will end with Lao Tzu. I love this line. Soften the light become one with the dusty world. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's talk about your book. Um, I like where you ended in particular, because it, it brings me to the first thing I want to say about this novel, Gone So Long. Um, I think it's, it's been years since I've read a work of fiction that is so completely imagined. And by that, I mean you do this remarkable thing of replicating the experience of what it is to feel something. 
And I almost imagine you working like an actor and that you are putting yourself into that character's life at that moment and writing moment by moment what that person sees and thinks and feels and notices. It sounds obvious when you say it. It's incredibly difficult to do. It takes incredible patience and stamina. And um, I, I want to talk to you about that, about, about how you have the stamina to write these fully imagined stories that you do. How do you keep going? Well, are these on? They are? Cool. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, it beats me is my is my quite is my answer. Um, well, I will, well, I do want to. Well, thank you. I'm having an insight right here in front of you. Uh, I think that too often in this, you, like you hear often, someone will say, "Was it therapeutic to write that book?" <laughs> well, actually, it felt like sticking my face into a dryer full of razor blades for three straight years. But thanks for asking. I think more times than not, it is the opposite of therapeutic. I, look, we're all writers here. If I walk around after a writing session feeling kind of sexy, attractive, and goddamn successful, oh, I wasn't writing well at all. <laughs> but if I walk around, and do you feel, if I walk around feeling raw, naked, vaguely nasty, insensitive, ignorant, and wrong, maybe I'm writing well today. The truth is, um, I do uh, try to free fall into the human situation with everything I try to describe tonight. Um, and I do find my own ritual, you guys, and it's it maybe from the childhood I told you about, but I go to the gym right after every session, and, and I do it to, um, to do two things, to push the dream world back where it came from. By the way, I think when we're writing, I feel like I'm writing more from here, this more kind of libidinal space than from here, and, and then I, I work out really hard to cleanse myself of where I went whether it was painful or not. And then I don't let myself talk about it or think about it until the next day. It takes me three to five years to finish a book, you guys. My wife was a dancer and choreographer and painter and my soulmate and 31 years together. I don't, five years, I won't tell her a thing. How do I write and go, good, I'm thinking about cooking a marinara. Wait, what do you think? Mar marinara? Should, should I do the tofu Thai peanut dish? You seem to like that, honey. I can't talk about it. And we're talking about this today. But I do think it's helpful for writers, and I don't think we talk about this enough, to not put the pressure on their writing to make you feel good. If you want to feel good, go make some pasta and eat it. <laughs> go run five miles, go make love, uh, go cut your grass. Don't, don't ask writing to make you feel good because it's, it's not there for you, you're there for it. I don't know if that answers your question, but. I, I think it's, it's the beginning of the answer to my question. Um, this novel, Gone So Long, is, um, interesting to me because it is, it's a story that happens very much in the past. It's a, it's a novel about longing and profound regret. Um, it, it deals with a fractured relationship, extremely fractured relationship between a father and daughter. And yet in the present story of the novel, there isn't that that much that happens. Yeah. That these are, these are haunted people and they spend a lot of time thinking about the past, ruminating over the past, um, being anguished over the past. How do you write a story like this? How do you keep it moving forward when so much of it actually happened in the past? Well, they make a nice dinner. <laughs> no, I worried about that. It's a novel where very little happens in real time, and there's a lot of looking back. All right, I love words. We writers love words, right? The word tree, remember? What's the opposite of remember? That's what we think. But no, the, act, the opposite of remember is, is not forget. It's actually chop, 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 dismember. And, and I say that because I was on a panel with some you know, really well-known uh, crime writers, and, and one of them said, uh, well, never have a flashback. Start your novel, start in action, put them in motion, and move them forward. Forget the fucking childhood, just keep going. And I was think, think, thinking, this thing, I should try that, but I can't. I can't do it. I can't do it because everything that happened before put me on this stage. And we are all, you know, the skins of an onion. But to answer your question, I think it's, so I rejected that for me in, the, in this book, but I, I do think it's important. Here's my thing. Forgive me guys, the jet lag's kicking in. I do not believe that our job is to entertain the reader. 
Our job is to engage the reader. So I don't think we need sexy tricks or gimmicks or hooks. I think if we're just writing really deeply and openly about a human being, if we're curious about it, the reader will be curious too. Now, I always overwrite. I'll write an 800 page uh, novel and cut 300 pages. So I, so I do do that, if that makes sense. But I, I don't think I answered your question again. <laughs> Did I? No, I don't think so. I do believe, okay, I, I can answer it. There's a wonderful uh, definition of story by the writer Janet Burway. She says, story is a causal sequence of events with a beginning, a middle, and an end. I like that. It doesn't have to be linear and chronological, but it begins somewhere, there's a middle experience, there's an end. The key word there is causality. And causality is, is, is engaging. It doesn't have to be a big one. Kurt Vonnegut famously said in the 60s at the Irish Writers Workshop, he said, yeah, I had a student writing from the point of view of a nun. She was flossing in the morning. She couldn't get the floss out between her teeth. I read all 23 pages to find out if she get the goddamn floss out. <laughs> So, I mean, the causality can be subtle. Yeah. Well, this novel is all, it's all about causality, really. Um, so, uh, the inciting event, for, for those who have not yet read the novel, um, this is the story of, and I should let you describe your book rather than have me explain what it is, but it's, um, it's a story about um, a young husband um, who um, kills his wife in, um, in sort of a burst of emotion and the aftermath of this horrible event. So the, the main characters in the story are this young husband many years later after he's done in time in prison and his grown daughter who does not know him and the mother of the, of the wife that he killed. So it's really, it's a, it's a novel with three characters in it. And um, it's certainly a study in causality because all three of these characters have had their lives sort of jump the tracks at the moment this thing happened. And it's about the aftermath of this event. So it's entirely causality. And, and 40 years later, I'm so glad you described it that way because I do want, it gives me a chance to talk about this whole writing thing in that way. Um, I wanted nothing to do with this story. You know, I, I talked about authentic curiosity and Faulkner. How many, has anyone in this room ever tried to fall in love with a particular person? Like you said, okay, that's the one I'm going to fall in love with. How'd it work out for you? It doesn't work. Me neither. I tried it. it, did, it and it came time to kiss. It was like kissing my mother. It just didn't work. You either fall in love or you don't. You can't. And you might even, I mean, <laughs> I won't say it. You can fall in love with someone who's not even your type and marry them and be very happy. My point is, in the same way, you can't choose what you're curious about. You're either curious about something or you're not. And I do think it's important that you trust what pulls you. I was working on a screenplay for years. I'm not a screenwriter. And um, it was based on a real man doing time in a Massachusetts prison. And I interviewed people who'd done time with him. And, and one was a man I took to lunch for two hours. We had a lovely lunch. He was in his 60s, really lovely man, kind of warm and gentle and... There's a, there's a sort of a, just a sweet quality to him. I really enjoyed the two hours and gave me all sorts of great notes for the project. So as I'm paying the bill, I said, hey, man, I know I'm not, not supposed to ask, but wh why'd you do 15 years? Oh, I killed my wife. And, you know, given what I explained to you about me and male violence against women, I have a particular hatred of it. And uh, I wanted to get away from him so fast. And... Um, I'm paying the bill, and it's one of those damn restaurants where the hallway is like a football field to the parking lot. We've got to walk down the hallway together, and I just want to get away from him, but I, I couldn't deny that I still liked him. I couldn't cancel out the fact that I enjoyed him for two hours at that lunch, but I still wanted to get away from him. I was horrified by what he just told me. So I said, hey, uh, well, you got kids? Oh, yeah, but they don't want to see me. And that sentence hung in my psyche for three years, and, and it would not leave. And I, and I wanted nothing to do with it. But again, back to what I was saying earlier, I think it's really important to follow your curiosity. And so I, I finally began to practice what I preach and, and stepped into his, his being. And he showed up. And so did the two women. And I also felt morally compelled, if I'm going to give a microphone to this man, after the horror he's done, I'm going to give two microphones to the victims. 
You know, um, when we talked a couple of weeks ago, I told you that you write really good women. And, um, you know, I want to talk more about that because I think it's a really important point. You know, there's a writer I admire tremendously, um, James Salter, who I think is one of the greatest stylists in American English of the 20th century. I, I really, um, I have great reverence for the sentences he wrote. Um, but I look at the body of his work now, and it is very clear to me that he never once wrote a female character he did not want to sleep with. This is not a small problem in the work of a writer. It means that he had absolutely no curiosity about half the human race that went beyond love and sex. And one thing I really um, respond to in Andre's work is that the female characters are, are fully alive, they're fully imagined, and they're, they're women who are not simply wives and girlfriends. They are complicated characters um, with, um, with intricate emotional lives. In this novel, um, Gone So Long, the character of Susan's grandmother, the mother of the young wife who was murdered, um, Lois, is, is um, my favorite character in the book and is extraordinarily well realized. This is a woman who's, who's 80 years old, who is no longer beautiful, who is not in good health, who is filled with bitterness against this man who took her daughter away. And she, she just jumps off the page. She is the most vibrantly alive character I've read in a very long time. And um, this, to me, says very much about what Ad Andre does so extraordinarily well as a writer. How did you find Lois? How did you find that character? Hmm. Well, thank you for those beautiful words, Jennifer. Um, look, back to that. I, I think this is the answer. So the, so the novel is dedicated to my own daughter, our daughter, Ariadne, who's 23. We have a 26-year-old son, 22-year-old son, almost 22, and Ariadne. And um, I dedicated it to her. Because I could feel, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, back to Willa Cather. A writer is at her best only when writing within the character and range of her deepest sympathies. I feel like my real life began when we had our kids. I didn't know that, I didn't know that kind of love was possible. I, I so treasure these miracles that the divine gave me and my wife. And they're grown up now, and they live elsewhere, and who knows, you're not supposed to keep them forever. But I think Lois came the easiest of the three characters. And I, and I think whether, you know, I'm, I'm not an 80-year-old woman, but I love my daughter. I would, like every parent in this room, take bullets for my kids instantly. You just would. And I just could feel the black abyss of agony that Lois must have gone through, and she's a she's a she's not a nice lady. She's she's not a sweetheart. She's she's a toughie. She's rude. She's bombastic. She's I like her though, you know. <laughs> but I so th I think that's my honest answer. Is is I wrote from my own parenthood, and um, male or female, we love our kids. And I think I I don't know if I would have written it. Up. I don't know. I don't know. That's my answer. You know, one thing I um, really appreciated about this book, and it surprised me, frankly, it was not what I expected, is the degree to which it is a novel about, about writing, about the act of writing and the mm. act of remembering. Um, the character of the daughter in this novel is an aspiring writer, a frustrated writer, um, who is trying to find a way to write her own story and, and the story of her family. And um, the novel begins, in fact, with her struggling with ways to do this. She tries to write it as a first person narrative. She tries writing it as fiction. And as I read this, I thought a lot about you, Andre, because your last book was this marvelous memoir, if you've not read it, Townie. Um, and uh, I think about you as a writer making that choice between fiction or memoir, between first person and third person. Um, so I guess my question to you is, which of those forms do you feel most comfortable in, writing memoir or writing novel? Are they very different? Have you written personal essays or? Not well. Di directly, but you have. But have you? Are you yeah. sure? That's hard to believe. This, she can write this one. Um, 
boy, I prefer fiction. I prefer fiction. I, I really do. Um, and, and for those of you who are writing a memoir or have or, or writing directly about your own lives in creative nonfiction, um, I'm really glad I wrote Townie. By the way, talk about phoenixes rising from the ashes. I was writing an essay about my sons in baseball. I just want to write an essay. Because of the childhood I explained to you, I'd never played sports with balls in them. I was a solo athlete, I was a boxer and all this. I was always in great shape, but I, I didn't know anything about, nothing about sports. I'm 40 years old, I've got two sons. They're playing T-ball and B-ball and C-ball. And now around age eight or nine, they're all playing together and I noticed they got a lot more competitive. Not with the kids, with whom? The parents and the coaches. I'm at a playoff game and, you know, my son Austin's a pitcher, and then the opposing pitcher gets on the mound. He weighs like 40 pounds. And his coach yells, this big drill instructor, I don't want nothing but strikes, Davey, strikes only. I think, holy shit. As far as I know, professional baseball players can't throw strikes only. So the following year, I vol this actually has to do with memoir. I volunteered to coach to protect my kids from the whack jobs, but I forgot, <laughs> I forgot I'd never played baseball and did not know how. No, my ignorance was profound. I did, I'm 41 years old. I didn't know the first two fouls were strikes. That doesn't seem fair. I didn't know you didn't have to slide into first. I didn't know that the first letter in the score was like the winning numbers and the second was the, the ones you lost. I like, all right. And the, you know, in the local business who supported us was a funeral home. And, and we all, they all had black, black uniforms with gold lettering. And, and, uh, there were moments that whole season where I go, Bob, run, Bob, run, kid. This nine-year-old say, coach, it's against the rules. He's, he can't run right now. <laughs> Are you sure? Yes. You're out, Bob. I'm sorry, kid. Come on back. We'll get some ice cream after the game. That first season, we were 1-15. And the only, the only reason we won that game is the other team didn't show up, and we forfeited and got the W. So I'm writing an essay. I said, okay, I was working on a collection of essays. I'm still working on that essay collection. And it's, I'm going to write my first funny thing. I'm going to write about the coach who didn't know how to play baseball. And, and I was really exploring how my sons brought me to baseball, not my father. Because I didn't live with them, right? The old age story, the pastime, the son and the father play catch. So I'm starting to write this essay. Three years and 500 pages later, I write my memoir, Townie. And every 30 pages, I go, all right, enough of this fighting shit. Get back to the ball, the, the funny, the, the... And this is what I mean about allowing it to go where it goes. Um, and when it, so when I wrote it, as I was writing it, I should say this too, about failure. For 28 years, I tried to write everything that's in Townie as three separate novels. One is Lie Down and Make Angels. I didn't think it was that bad. Another one that's was really called... Bad. Yeah, I know. It's, uh, it's like an Andy Williams song. <laughs> Another one was uh, Shoe City, not as bad. That's still pretty bad. Yeah, yeah. And then another one, whatever it was, it wasn't good. I do not exaggerate. Nine years of writing. Three years each, three separate novels. Each one failed. Because of what I said to you earlier, I was trying to say something about my childhood, and I was not curious about it. And for years, I've been trying to find a way to write about violence. But how do you write about knocking people out without sounding like a dangerous jerk? But the way in was through the bewildered boy who didn't know sports. And the way in was through my single mother and moving and poverty and fear. And that's how I wrote this accidental memoir. While writing it, I, I kept feeling the presence of my three kids and I was Richard Dreyfuss, the actor, says, hey, and I was turning 50 when I was writing it. He said, you know, if a man turning 50 in this country is probably closer to his grave than his high school graduation. But I was aware of that. I, you know, not in a maudlin way. I was just thinking, I'm going to leave this for my kids. I, I didn't want to publish it. I didn't, wasn't even sure I was going to send it to my publisher. I just, it, it felt good to have found a way into the truth, at least my truth, my subjective truth. But the hardest part of writing it, and this is why I prefer fiction to memoir, is I had to write about my family. And I didn't know where the line was, so I left them out. So when I finally did send it to my editor, thinking, well, maybe this is worth reading, she says, well, this fighting's interesting, but didn't you live with people? 
I said, yeah, but I don't want to violate their privacy. I don't want, what am I, you know, what am I going to do? She said, but isn't that part of your story? I said, yeah, but, and what was I leaving out? I was leaving out that my sister had been gang raped. I was leaving out that she was selling drugs. I was leaving out my brother was suicidal. I was leaving out that he was being sexually abused by his female special ed teacher for six years in our house daily. I was leaving out that my little sister was so depressed I thought she was going to just disappear and that my mother was hanging on by her fingertips and would come home after 14 hours in work clothes and fall asleep on the floor and we could come and go and do whatever we wanted. I left out that my father was never around. So not long after that, our mutual friend, Richard Russo, the writer, I was at a literary thing, and I said, hey, man, I know she's right, but I don't know where the line is. And I want to share with you what Richard Russo told me, because it was immensely helpful, and it might be helpful to you if you're writing a memoir. He said, if it were me, I'd ask myself, am I trying to hurt anybody with this book? Am I trying to settle any scores? He said, if the answer is yes, I wouldn't write it, or I'd write it, but I wouldn't publish it. He said, but the answer is no, I'm just trying to capture what it was like for me then I would go ahead and write it. And as soon as he said that, I knew I wasn't trying to hurt anybody. I wasn't even mad at anybody. I was just trying to capture what it was like to be that kid in that mill town in the 70s with a single mom before I left the world. And that ultimately became towny. But once I finished it and started writing from the point of view of a <laughs> stripper working in a club in Florida, I was so much happier. <laughs> I'm going to be a 26-year-old woman taking off clothes for money. This is so much easier than what I was doing. <laughs> okay, at this point, we're going to open it up for questions from the audience. Um, so there's a microphone right there in the center aisle. And um, does anyone have a question? Rob, do you want to run that I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to get us started. Okay. Um, so anybody who wants a question, do, do just queue up behind this microphone and go for it. But Andre, I, I know that, I happen to know that you read poetry um, as part of your daily practice. Can you talk about the importance of poetry to your work? Yes, I can, my, cool. my poet brother. Well, I'm sure there are poets in the room. I, um, I had this lovely girlfriend before I met my beautiful wife, and she, uh, my girlfriend dumped me the way they do. And she, the last gift she gave me, like days before she dumped me, was Edward Hirsch's Wild Gratitude, published in the 80s. Edward Hirsch is one of our major American poets. And, and um, I'm in a fetal position, crying on the couch for days, <laughs> dumped. But I'm reading this thing, and what's this goddamn poetry book? And I'm reading it, and my soul is just, the bomb of the gods has descended. And I've been reading poetry uh, Every writing day, I try to write five days a week. Um, I read it. I read poetry every every day before I write. I've been doing that for about thirty six years. So now I have hundreds of collections of poems in my um, in my cave, and 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 really, it's it's frankly, it's just it's it's how I put rose petals on the bed, put on a little Luther Vandross, light a candle. <laughs> When I was young, a couple of poems, I'm all set. Now I need five or six poems. <laughs> Did I just say that out loud? But I really, I, I love poetry. I'm going to give you one right now from Ted Kuzer. Two lines. Ted Kuzer from his Pulitzer Prize winning collection, Delights in Sh Shadows. Thank you. This is called Starlight. All night long. Shit. All night long. This soft rain from the distant past. No wonder I sometimes wake as a child. Don't you feel like writing too? This one from Jane Kenyon, Looking at the Stars. It is not the dry God, the God of curved space that will save us, but the sun whose blood spattered the hem of his mother's robe. I recommend poetry. I'll call on someone. I'm a teacher. Can I just shout it out? Shout it out. Yes. Right. I'm curious how much time you spend with the characters outside of the context of the story. I want you to answer that, first of all. How about you? Mm. I'll answer, but I want to hear from What's your name? Andrea. Hi, Andrea. 
Okay, well, my answer. Um, before I start writing a novel, I spend about six months just writing about the characters, um, figuring out who these people are, so that when I sit down to write chapter one, I'm not writing about strangers anymore. I, I know these people as well as I know the members of my own family, and then it becomes much easier to, to you know, put them on stage and let them act. But until I know kind of who they are and where they came from, I can't really do that with any integrity. So I need about six months of, of, of warm up where I'm just writing their childhoods and kind of writing their inner life and writing what scares them and, and what they want from life. And once I've done that, I'm able to start. Wow. I just do a blind date and a one night stand. <laughs> no, I, ne I really, I like hers better. That sounds like a real writer. No, I'll write, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just step in, start a scene, learn from them by what they do. Like I learned, so this, this novel, House of Sand and Fog, one of the, the characters is a, is, a, is a law enforcement guy who's dating, or who's interested in the main character, this woman, Kathy. And uh, he takes her out to dinner, and, and he, she has told him she's a recovering alcoholic, but he, he seduces her into having a glass of wine. And then he tells her a story of how uh, there was a domestic violent a DV call they had to do with cops, and this guy kept beating up his wife, and she would keep protecting him. And they got tired of going to the calls and seeing her bruised and bloodied, and so they went into his house, and the and the the sheriff character stif stuffs um, an eight ball of coke in the guy's closet, and they arrest him for drug possession. That just came out in the dialogue, but I learned so much about him. I learned. That he's kind of a loose cannon. I learned, I learned more from the fact that he talked her into having a glass of wine even when he knew she was probably alcoholic. So I learned by having them in, in scene. But your real question, Andrea, seems to be do you, outside of the writing process. Um, I, I want to hear what you have to say about this too, Jennifer. But I try not to think about them, but they still show up. right? It's like trying to forget the one you used to love. They'll show up. But I, the reason I try not to think about them, there's a wonderful line. I'm going to talk more about this tomorrow in the workshop I, I'm going to do. But Richard Bausch, one of my favorite contemporary American writers, also said, if you think that you're thinking when you're writing, think again. You're much closer to the dream inside of your mind, so dream, dream, dream it through. And so um, the reason I try not to let myself think about the characters when I'm not writing in the morning is I'm afraid I'll start thinking about them and, and throwing made up things about them into the pot. Instead, I really trust discovering things as I go, um, which is a really uh, disorganized and sloppy way to write, but it, 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 to me it leads to, to, to little truths that I build on and I shave away anything that is false. Does that make sense? But then they still show up. Like, I'll be at a restaurant and think, Jesus, that looks just like Lois. Oh, my God. Get down, sublimate that, push it down. Do you find that when you're writing a novel, everything in life reminds you of your novel yes! in some way? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. It's like this elaborate form of mental illness. No, it is. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. happened today. Yeah. Or was it Rome? It was, it was friggin' Rome. It was, I was in Italy, and there was a car. I said, Jesus, my character's got the same fucking car. I think he's following me. <laughs> right, you're right. You're in a. You're in a. Well, actually, Flannery O'Connor called that anagogical vision. Anagogical? Did she yeah. make that up? Move on, because I feel like I just made it up. Yeah. No. <laughs> anagogical vision. I actually think it, it has to do with actually biblical re reading the Bible and, and interpreting things. But it, 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 you're in a heightened state of awareness where you see a connectivity between things you don't normally see. And, and yeah, so when I'm working on a novel like I am now, it's uh, whatever I'm working on shows up, right? It's really cool. It's, so, it's terrifyingly wonderful. What else, guys? Yes. What's your name, Courtney? My name is Courtney. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know I was going to ask this question, but you just spoke about when you're in the process of writing, walking around, finding connections, feeling intense sensitivity to the world around you. So what advice do you have for writers who are in the depths of their process and just feeling so open to the world and our world is an intense and painful place? 
God, that is such an important question. Thank you. Courtney is a writer, a friend of mine. She's a beautiful writer, by the way. Um, well, I want to hear your answer, too, but I do have something to say. There's a wonderful biography of James Jones, the novelist from Here to Eternity, James Jones, by the wonderful writer George Garrett. And he, and he describes, uh, you know, Jones wrote from Here to Eternity while in the Army in the 40s, stationed in Hawaii during World War II. And because he was the 40s, he had to hide the fact that he was writing a novel, because if the guys found out he was writing a novel, they, he would be accused of being a homosexual and a bohemian. And so he, he hid the fact that he was working on the novel in the barracks between, you know, KP duty and whatever he did. And there's this wonderful line from, metaphor from George Garrett. He said, Jones learned to hold his talent inside him, his gift inside him, like warm water between two cupped hands. And, and I, and I, Courtney, your, your question is profound. We do not live in a culture that's hospitable to the creative act. You'll get all, all sorts of attention when Oprah picks your book or you win an Academy Award, but try getting any goddamn respect until you have some sort of success. And by the way, right, I have painter friends, and they say, you know, what's the first thing, if you have the courage to tell someone, so what do you do? Well, I'm, I'm a writer. What's the first goddamn question they ask? Yes, well, when they, they say, they'll say it like this. And is there anything I might know? <laughs> or are you a loser? Right? <laughs> but a painter, you tell somebody you're a painter, they go, oh, acrylic or oil. Right? <laughs> and so my point, though, but Courtney, your question it goes deeper than that. Um, there is no way, I think, and I, I, I really want to hear your response to that. There's no way that we can be truth tellers, truth seekers, whether we're writing comedy or tragedy or in between, if we are not allowing ourselves to be open and vulnerable as hell. But then we've got to go into the world. And a lot, you know, a lot of us have to go to work, to some cubicle. You know, or we got to, you know, for years I was a carpenter. You know, I'd write in the mornings and put on a, a belt and climb ladders and, you know. I think you got to find a way, Courtney and everybody, to hold that warm water and cupped hands, two cupped hands inside you, to do whatever you need to do to compartmentalize. You know, too much compartmentalization and you're mentally ill. Not enough and you're too raw, naked, and unprotected. So I think there is a fine balance there. You know, I, I like this question a lot. Um, and it's something I've thought about when I've gone through particularly difficult periods in my own life, that the fact of being a writer makes it seem like there's a point to all of it. And I sometimes wonder, what do people do if they don't write about what is devastating? You know, it's like at least yeah. you can do something with it. You can make something out of it, that there is this possibility of a generative <laughs> act. It's not just simple suffering. And so it's that, that thought has helped me through some very difficult times in my own life, some, some difficult losses. Well, I can make something from this anyway. I had to live through it, but at least I can make something from it. Beautiful. And Tobias Wolf, one of our great short story writers, and also a wonderful memoirist, Tobias Wolf has this wonderful line. He's, uh, he, was, he says, look, fiction, nonfiction, literature, writing is one of the most optimistic arts, he said, mm -hmm. even if you're writing bleak tragedy, even if you're writing hopelessly bleak Kafkaesque work, it's essentially affirming, he said, because the greatest sign of despair is silence. So, you know, whatever that's worth, Courtney. It's a great question. Yes, kind sir. What I understand, you probably don't outline or pre-plan any of your novels. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, but I want to explain. So we talked about story being a causal sequence of events with a beginning, a middle, and an end. And I'm also going to lift this from my friend Janet Burway because I think it's an elegant description of plot. She said, plot is how we arrange that causal sequence of events. Back to Richard Bausch. He said, dream it through. He said, but then try to be terribly smart about what you've dreamed and look at it the way a doctor looks at an x-ray. And so for me, the, re the revision process, what's your name, sir? Vlado. 
Vlado, I'm glad I asked. What culture is that, Vlado? They're short for Vladimir, so because people want to truncate to Vlad, I tell them Vlado Marco Polo, or Marco Polo Vlado, so they would not... So Vlado, beautiful. So, I mean, but look, my, my issue with outlining is that, when we, and there's nothing wrong with that. John Irving does it. I love his novels. Um, but very few, you don't outline, do you? I did it once, but I never ended up writing the book. There you go. So what happened was I started writing an outline, and it was a great outline, by the way. It was, a, it was the best outline I, I, I think I've ever read. Um, but, you know, by the time I figured out the whole causal chain of events, I'm like, well, well, I don't need to write this now because I already know what happens. I think that I write novels for the same reason I read them. I read to see what happens. And once I figure all of that out, well, why bother to go through the trouble of writing it? So, so for me, if there's one sure way to kill off a novel project, it's to outline the thing. Do you even know the end, or at least what's the main no, conflict? I, no, I don't. I don't. I don't. And I got to tell you, it's always gone better for me when I've known very little, because that forces me to be authentically curious. Um, but look, whatever way it works. But I, you know, I teach a 14-week four, semester at University of Massachusetts, and I just ask my students, just try this way that I'm trying to show you. But here's what I find time and time again. If you, I'm going to talk about this a lot tomorrow. If you are trying to really become someone on the page, which means you've got to bring in some of the five senses. Like right now, we're having a lovely conversation in a dark, beautiful theater. If we, if these walls were instead plate glass windows and outside it was snowing, we'd be having a totally different human moment. In fact, it might change the conversation entirely, right? If we're having this right before lunch and everybody, okay, I did a talk in Dallas, Texas, Dallas, at some really nice museum, and I had a really big crowd because I had a big bestseller at the time and always feeling like somebody. And I'm getting up there and I'm trying to watch my manners because it's Dallas and I secretly hate Dallas because they killed Kennedy. And, and so I, <laughs> even though I wear cowboy boots, ah, you goddamn Texans. And, but, you know, they're nice rich people from Dallas. And I'm, but I'm, I'm giving a talk. And, you know, this seems to be going well. They seem to be looking at me. And then they're all squinting at me like, like this. I say, holy shit. Did I swear? I swear too much. Did I drop an F-bomb in conservative Dallas, Texas? Now, and then they're really giving me the eyeball. What the? And I'm starting to panic a little bit. And then I turn from my glass of water to compose myself, and I see way up in the, 40 feet up in the wall is a transom, and the sun is setting in all their eyes. <laughs> now, if that were in a novel, let's, let's say your public speaker doesn't see that, but he just, he reacts to their, the causality. Well, the hell with you people! You killed Kennedy anyway, goddamn it! I'm like it! Goes off there, gets drunk, screws the waitress, cheats on his wife, wakes up in a jail cell without you outlining any of it. You just found it by trying to be the guy. <laughs> Great. And I wanted to ask you, what's your approach to revision? And I'll just uh, get... What's your approach to revision, Jennifer Hagen? Well, it's the only part of writing that I actually like, and it's the only part I'm any good at. So the first draft to me is pure pain, and that usually goes on for a couple of years. And I could just revise the thing forever. I, my favorite part of revising is the final, final draft where I'm just putting in commas and taking them back out again. I could do that all day long. I just love to punctuate, you know? Just, just play with the rhythm of the sentence. Just hear the music of it. So unless someone takes this out of my hands, I'll just revise it for 10 years. I, I love that. <laughs> Well, look, but, it, but it, she is, t I, I'm with you too, but here she said, two years of pain, and then it gets good for another, what, year or two of revising, whatever yeah, yeah. it takes. Um, for me, Vlado, it, it has to, I'll, I'm, I'm going to quote Willie Keller. My wife says, you know, honey, you don't have any wisdom of your own. It's just like a Rolodex of other people's wisdom. <laughs> I said, well, you know, honey, it's called attribution. Willie Cather, this gives me goosebumps. Artistic growth is, if nothing else, a refining of the sense of truthfulness. So this new novel, Gone So Long, that we've been talking about, the character Susan is a writer in the book that exists in the world now. But for 19 months, she was an actress. For 19 months, Lotto, 
I am writing from the point of view of a beautiful actress in L.A., baby. I'm taking my Hollywood experience. I'm writing my Hollywood novel. I'm on yachts. This is so much fun. Hemingway has this great line, every writer needs a built-in shockproof shit detector. Like every other day, my shit detector would go off. i said, quiet, this is good shit, relax. And I worked, and worked, and now I'm at Miami Book Fair, I have to give like two talks, and I've got like three hours, so I, I've been having a queasy feeling for weeks. And I, and I read the entire novel bef before lunch, and it's one of those sickening, horrible days where I realize it's all got to go. And what I'm going to talk about in depth tomorrow, and I wonder what you think about this. I do think there's a difference between making it up on one hand and imagining it on another. That, you know, we can write this, but just because we wrote it well, did it really happen? You know, I've been writing long enough that the writing wasn't bad. In fact, in some ways, it was some of the better writing I've done in a long time because I was lying my ass off. But I finally accepted that she's not an actor. You just don't want to write about a writer. Well, tough shit, she's a writer. So I had to throw away 140 pages, and I kept nine, and I started over. So I revise as I go, but it's, it's all to truth. It's truth, and it's an intuitive thing. And um, I think the rewriting is everything. And it is. It's the most fun, too. How are we, we on time? This One nice question. person in the back. Andre, it's good seeing you again. Oh my God! Hey. What are you doing here? I'm Lim Seattle now. Oh How you this doing? Is my student, Big Fish. She's from Low Mass. I'm from Low Mass. Seriously, she's my best friend. She's amazing. Wow, we had a good class. Oh, yeah, that was a great class. Oh my God, I really enjoy it. You don't mind if I can share a few things of like. You know, the time, like, right after I took your class, you don't mind if I share that uh, with you. Uh, Andre, honestly, the, after the time I took class with you, it, I just took your teaching and I put it to my heart. And I just want to thank you so much for just, like, giving me the chance to be a writer again. And just, like, you know, it was my last semester of my senior year. And, you know, senior year semester, it can get a little crazy, but I was very happy to take the opportunity to be, you know, um, be your student, you, be, you being my professor. And I'm very happy that, you know, you gave me the opportunity to, um, to write a story that's very hard for me to write. I think the most challenging that you, Ty, parents all of to write about is, like, to write something the most traumatic thing that happened to you in the past. And when I wrote that, I just broke in tears while I was writing it. Like, oh, my goodness, this is so uncomfortable, but yet, it felt so rewarding, though, because this thing was hiding for so long, and I finally get the chance to release it out. Are you still working on it? Are you still? I'm still working on it. Okay, man, we're going to catch up. I have the same email. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, buddy. Yeah, but, Thank you. It, but I wanted to let you know that uh, I came to Seattle because I have a relative here, and um, I think I make the great decision to be here because I love Seattle. And I'm just so happy when I saw the ticket to Andre Dubuque, Hugo House. I just bought a ticket in a heartbeat. But, Andre, it's great seeing you again. <laughs> That just made my night. Know about you guys. Okay, I think we can take one more. Thank you, buddy. Anybody. This young lady, maybe both young ladies. Do you start with a theme? Do you start with a character? What's your name? Oh, Rose. Hi, Rose. Um, I start with a character and often a place. And, yep. and I, I see such a strong sense of place in all of your work, actually. But, um, but this last novel in particular, so I'd love to hear you talk about the role of But it's funny, I, I do the same. It's, yeah. it's character and place. And for me, it's, um, it's so weird, though, Rose. Uh, you know, my novel, Garden Last Days, is a really long, multiple point of view novel. It began with an image of a wad of cash on a bedroom bureau. I never start with theme, because for me, that would be writing on the outside, from the outside in. I, I, I trust the images. 
I trust the situation. I described the cash, and it became clear that they were, they were the tips of a stripper. I'm not a strip club guy. I don't know about strip clubs. I don't know how that showed up. Outside the window were palm trees. I'm from New England. I'm in Florida. And in the very first writing session, I discovered that the, that the character is in her 20s. She's got a uh, three-year-old child, little girl. Uh, the, the babysitter who normally watches her kid is sick, and so the, my young stripper has to take her to the strip club while she dances. And that's the opening moment. But it came from, so, so it was character and place. You know, place is huge. Place is it's so important. And too many writers, especially now, uh, I've noticed, they're not paying attention to place. If, if the heart of character-driven fiction is character, which in fact we know it is, then for me, the place are the lungs, and your character literally cannot breathe if they're not in a real place. And it gives you so much to work with. This whole notion of authentic curiosity. So if you have a person in a real place, and if you start to dig with authentic curiosity, asking off the Mike Nichols line, what's it like? What's it really like to be in this thing that's happening? Guess what? You find organic trouble without having to throw it at your character like Zeus. It'll just show up. Wow, I think she's unhappily married. Wow, I think he's got a drinking problem. Wow, she's broke and she needs to get gas for her car. How's she going to get it? And it, it just starts to write itself, and it's so much fun. Thank you, Rose. Did you want to ask real quick or no? And the kind of wounding that you get from not having something. And huh. to me, when I'm writing, it seems like it's harder to write about things that didn't happen to you because there's nothing really to latch on to. And so my question was, um, do you feel, find yourself having different approaches to how you deal with the characters when the things that they're struggling with happen either to them or from a lack of something not being there? When you're talking about lack of something, you're really talking about lack of something good, like love, yeah. like sustenance, like being cared for, right? I guess. As, a, as opposed, well, it's very interesting. So, so one wound would be something's been done, harmfully done to someone. Another is an absence. Withheld. Yeah, something was withheld. And if, so in order for it to be a wound, it has to be something good was withheld, like love. I don't think there's a difference. I, I, think, I, I think our job is to simply plumb the depths of the human heart, whether it's a man or woman or gender fluid person, whatever it is. And I wouldn't think about it. I would not think about it. If, if I'm, I'm, I'm getting a sense that this is something you're dealing with and, and you know about. So I will say this. Sometimes we're not ready to write about what we're writing about. And, and you may be dealing with that, you may not be. But if you are ready to write about it, if you just enter in with, the, with emptying yourself and asking what's it like to be this human being in this moment, he or she will lead you to the wound and, and beyond the wound. As a friend of mine who is an actor in the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts said once to one of his students, none of us are one note. We are all a symphony. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Jennifer Haig.